We good for Mike? Can you guys yeah, hear me? Good. Okay. All right, guys. Well, um, we're super uh, blessed tonight to have uh, Aaron Chef Wallace um, join us. For those uh, uh, that were on the mission trip, so Ben and Wesley, y'all were out here last March. Remember, Aaron um, had a spirited debate with Kwaku, and you can you can go online and watch that. Uh, I think really uh, kind of lays bare the differences between the you know the Mormon position and, and the in uh, the Christian position. So um, I really encourage you to what he's done. A, you've done a couple debates with Kwaku, so uh, you can watch all of them. All of them are good. Uh, Aaron has been out, you know, was it was in Utah for what, like 15 years, right? Yeah, and then and then has now, uh, you know, Cole said, spoiler alert, Aaron won. Uh, so uh, Cole, uh, so Aaron is now in seminary, and I, I'll let you kind of share a little bit about, you know, what kind of your plans and what you have going on, Aaron. But just, um, you know, we got a chance to meet him when we first moved out here, and he was just, you know, someone who just has a love for the Mormon people, um, as I think. Uh, probably had more conversations with LDS probably than anyone I know and has done it, you know, has, has really um, developed a way of doing that that is loving and caring and challenging at the same time. And all of us could uh, just learn, learn a lot from his uh, methodology. And so we, we'll, you know, really, uh, again, blessed to have him speak to the group tonight. We would have him speak to us we, we, last year when he spoke to the group when they were here. But again, he's in Missouri for at least for a couple of years uh, at seminary. And then hopefully, We'll come back here to Utah. So, Aaron, I will turn it over to you. Uh, if you have, I don't know if you need, um, if you need to, you know, if I need to give you the screen or something, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, take it away. Cool. Yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I moved to Utah in 2005 of December. And this is a fun story. I remember. I got crossing the border on my birthday, this is December 10th with my dad in the truck. And it was only like maybe like a, a week or two later, uh, my wife and I heard about this set, this, uh, you might call it a nativity scene uh, at BYU. And we, we thought it was too strange to be true. So we went and looked at it. And what it was, it was a little cradle with Joseph Smith in it next to a Christmas tree. And it was commemorating, I think his 200th birthday. So he was born in 1805, December 23rd. And then it had a, a sign in front of the, the carriage or cradle that said something to the effect of, may we remember his life and sacrifice. And uh, you can find that on the internet. It's the uh, Joseph Smith nativity scene. That probably come up pretty quick, but um, we were there and we saw it and it was just kind of a welcome to Utah uh, event for us. Uh, we moved to Orem, Utah, which is very thick, you know, uh, with, with uh, the Mormon people. And we spent a couple of years down there, maybe a year and a half, two years. And we ended up moving up to Salt Lake City in part because uh, what I really, really moved to Utah for was, was evangelism. Uh, that matured that desire and ambition matured and evolved over time to really funnel toward church planning uh, attached to a local church aimed at serving the local church but what we would do for three seasons of year a year is go down to temple square in salt lake city to the uh, south or north gate and we would do evangelism and what that in practice meant is handing out tracts and starting conversations with LDS people. There's a lot of people that are going downtown uh, with their with their honey, you know, having a cheesecake factory date and strolling through the peaceful setting of Temple Square and enjoying the, the environment. Or there's people there to see, uh, to, to go do temple ordinances. Or there's people there that just work around the area or there's business convention goers or skiers or tourists. So it was really a neat cultural epicenter intersection point. And it, it was really hard to beat until COVID hit. Um, and the last year I spent in Utah, uh, we moved because of COVID down to Provo City Center Temple in Provo. Um, that was cool. Uh, the, the demographic instantly changed for us. It was a bunch of young adults, uh, many of them BYU students, but just the demographic, there's young, and it was just different because we got to speak in a different way. 
And what was neat about it is we uh, matured over the years in doing, I call it stranger evangelism. Uh, it's not relational in the sense that it doesn't have a high likelihood of ongoing, recurring, you know, uh, reconnection, although you aim for that. Um, but it's really uh, that most of your interactions in the stranger context are with people you've never met before and you'll like, likely never meet again. And so uh, we would gather with people from, say, five or six different churches, and we would hand out tracts and we start conversations. So what I'll do with you for the next hour or so is try to empower you to show up and immediately be conversant, uh, meaning to start a conversation. It's really not that complicated. You can totally do it. Um, my agenda is to make you feel like, oh, I can do this. And my agenda is also to let Mormonism be just a, a, an excuse, a launch pad for thinking about much more beautiful and true things, namely about the nature of God and the gospel. So Mormonism is just a temporary distraction or in some ways. It's just a, a, it's a, we can just kind of use it as a, a pivot point for talking about things we really love. And then my last agenda here is I would love it if some of y'all would just come to move to, move to, Utah, move to Utah and um, someday help plant a church and attach yourself to a, a local body of believers and raise your kids here suffer and die that would be great <laughs> just 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 mom and dad i'm so sorry i have i i, I can't live visit as often as i thought i could i'm all the way out here in utah because you're serving the, the utah people and you love them so that's a i would love for more christians to move out there and love all the mormon people love all the ex-mormon atheists and okay let's so let's just start talking about conversation starters um when i'm on the street and i am handing out a tract and i'm uh, gauging someone's body language, I'm typically trying to, to feel out, do they want, do they want to go away immediately? Are they giving me the signal that I, do, I don't want, I have anything to do with this? I, they might take a track, but if they look like they're going to slow down a little bit, or you can kind of tell they're not completely offended by you being there, um, you might ask them a question. Um, and so for us, it was uh, bread and butter to ask, hi, my, you know, my name's Aaron. Where, where are you from? Um, uh, are you from around here? Um, hi, can I explain uh, what the tract or what the pamphlet says? Uh, if you're curious, I could give a summary to you if you'd like. Um, uh, we, we've learned that in the context of a stranger evangelism, it is especially not appropriate to be stealthy. It's especially appropriate to be forward and overt and straightforward. It's the most respectful thing to do. It's very freeing and liberating. You had, you had to spend all week long, nine to five, working your heart out at a job um, where you, you've ached to share the gospel. And this is really your moment on the street to, um, you don't have to, you know, like naturally accidentally end up at the gospel. You can just be overt. Like I'm a Christian. I'm here to talk about Jesus. I'd love to have a religious discussion with you. And you'd be surprised about how many people in Utah are like, sure. Okay. Um, you'd, you'd be especially surprised how fruitful that can be if you just spend a couple hours at it and, and you, you're you content with a 20% you know, <laughs> acceptance rate, if you just kind of accept rejection, if you accept rejection as, a, as, as just a reality and you maintain respect and you maintain you know, work ethic and you just keep praying that God would provide one good conversation for the evening, God is so good. He lavished us. He lavished us almost every week with conversations and we would just go home glowing and debriefing in the car and it was like half the joy uh just to be caravanning and talking with other believers about a conversation that went well or it didn't go well and sort of just processing what we went through so one of the things that i would ask a stranger on the street who i had ascertained was a latter-day saint is uh did you go on a mission and that question for me uh helps unlock for them uh, a very sweet time in their life, a very spiritually formative time in their life, uh, especially for these kids now, they're like 18 and 19 years old. They're barely out of mom's house. They're kids, they're not even young adults, they're just kids. Um, and so uh, in any case, that, but for many of the Latter-day Saints we spoke to, they were maybe, night, excuse me, 19 and 20, and uh, when they were on their mission. So we like to ask, well, where did you go? Where did you grow on your mission? 
and that can be kind of a, a point of pride or just, you know, meh. Uh, oh, I got to go to France or I got to go to Spain. And uh, and that's where I love to just ask open-ended questions like, well, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Um, what kind of people did you get to talk to? Um, <clears throat> and I, lo I love to just say, hey, tell me more about some experiences you had. What are some highlights? What are some highlights you had on your mission? And then, and you, uh, you'll see real quickly here what my agenda is, and my conversation partner can see that as well. Um, did you ever get to talk to, with any born-again Christians on your mission? Did you ever get to talk with any Baptists or Presbyterians or Evangelicals? And for your Latter-day Saint conversation partner, those terms are just like gobbledygook. They, they don't mean much to them. So I kind of have to load it up with like, what's it, you know, they're thinking like, what's a born again Christian or what's an evangelical, or they might have like a narrow category of what that means for you. And I, it's just this general category of Christians that have shared basic belief systems around the Bible and the gospel. Um, Trinitarian saved by faith alone. We need to be born again. Jesus is coming back. So uh, I'll ask, you know, did you ever get to talk with any born again Christians on your mission? Uh, and the follow up question to that is, well, what did you talk about? Did you guys ever get to talk about anything uh, about faith and doctrine and theology? But what are some of the most interesting conversations you had with your evangelical dialogue partners? Um, or you, you, they might tell me about some of your experiences with that. Maybe they had a bad experience and you can try to patch that up. But typically you've had some faithful believers. I, I don't want to, I never want to make friends with a Mormon by throwing other Christians under the bus. I, I never want to um, use that as a cheap uh, way to say, oh, I can't believe. Yeah, if it's a faithful brother and, you know, even if they're rough around the edges and even if they said some foolish things. What, I, what I'm aiming to do is build on the existing efforts of other Christians. What that also does is it gives me topics. So I'll, I'll ask like, well, what did you talk about? And what my agenda is, I want them to put some topics on the table for us to talk about. So let me come back to that. Um, whether or not someone's been on a mission, another question I like to ask is, where did you grow up? Where in Utah did you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? I might ask. Um, and then I like to ask, uh, did you ever have any born again Christian friends? And uh, a lot of times, no. But if they did have a born again Christian friend, same questions, same follow up. Uh, did you guys ever get to have any interesting faith conversations about doctrine and theology, Bible and scripture and prophets? Um, and if they say yes, I, I like to ask, well, what did you talk about? And again, my agenda is for them to put some topics on the table for us to, to work with. Um, so if they say something that is something we can chase out, you know, I, I might follow up by saying, well, tell me more about that. What, and, and here's like, if I'm, uh, I've done this for a decade and a half and I still get to places where I just freeze up and I'm like, I have no idea what to say next, <laughs> or like I'm I'm super I'm super tired, or I only slept like three hours last night, or this person's personality is totally throwing me off. I have no idea what to say. I have a few questions that are just on my belt, and I'll just use them to be like, uh, uh, and I I'll give them to you, and they're just simple. Like, well, what would you say are some of the biggest differences between uh, Mormonism? And that's kind of a a sensitive term these days because they're like, we're not Mormons, we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't, I don't have time for that drama at the moment. Maybe it'll be fruitful for you at some other point, but I, I'm just like, well, uh, for Latter-day Saints or for, you know, for, for the LDS people, don't, don't use LDS as a noun, by the way. It's an adjective. It's not the LDS, it's uh, LDS something. Um, so what would you say are some of the biggest differences between what Latter-day Saints believe and what evangelicals or mainstream Christians or historic Christianity believes. What would you say in terms of the teachings are the biggest differences? What, what most importantly in terms of theology separates the Latter-day Saint faith with uh, historic Christian Christendom? And that's where, again, I'm having them put topics on the table. And I, and if they give, if, if they give me something that's interesting, but it's really not at the top of the list, 
um, then I'll say, huh, that's interesting. Tell me more. What else? You know, just I'm just fishing it out and I'm trying to get the conversation going and continued. So they might say something like, well, we believe in modern day prophets, which is a really important uh, topic. And you could totally work with that. Um, but that might not, you know, you might say, well, you know what I really want to talk about? I want to talk about the gospel. I want to talk about the nature of God and the reliability of scripture. So you might, you might just say something like, well, that's interesting. What else? And if they list one of those topics that you're really going for, you could just say, well, tell me more about that. Like, what would you say, like, what, what differentiates? And here's where um, you can really save yourself. Uh, so a lot of people know me through YouTube, through the most dramatic <laughs> conflict and interactions through debates and stuff like that. But a lot of this stuff is just uh, bread and butter and through worldly eyes is very boring, very repetitive and simple. It's very like Sunday school. It is not exciting and adventurous in the sense of conflict and drama. A lot of this is just gentle seed sowing, soil tilling. And here's where you can really save yourself a lot of just wasted time. Um, at this point, I like to say something like, you know, having asked, what are the biggest differences or what's the biggest difference on this topic or how do you understand that is, um, well, what's your understanding of what evangelicals believe about that? Like what, in, in your understanding, what do you think we believe about that? Um, because you'll find that 95% of the time, it's not that your Latter-day Saint conversation partner understands what you believe and why you believe it and disagrees. It's that they have no idea what you believe about this and they don't have any idea of why you believe it. And so you have a lot of legwork you can do as a Christian to say something like, huh, would you mind if I explained, this is another one of those uh, top, top three questions I ask. Um, would you mind if I took a minute to explain what evangelicals believe about that? Um, and I'm just really trying to get um, some soft space here to give gentle explanations of what Christians believe. So like a really good example of this would be the Trinity is, um, uh, what's your understanding of what Christians believe about the Trinity? In, in your view, what is the Trinity? I know you don't believe the Trinity, but like, what, what's your understanding as a Latter-day Saint of what the Trinity even is? And you'll find that a lot of them think that we believe Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are uh, three, you could say, modes. They're one person. That they, they think that we believe it's one person. So they have a misunderstanding of what the Trinity is. And so I get to ask um, something like, well, um, have you ever heard a Christian explanation of that topic before? That's another variation on that. Have you ever heard a Christian explain, insert topic here before. So I remember talking in front of the Provo uh, Missionary Training Center, which by the way, could be a cool uh, evangelism spot if you wanted to drop like five or six folks or in front of the MTC Center in Provo. Um, I don't know if that worked during COVID season, but uh, uh, I have no idea what the logistics are of the COVID down there. But um, in better seasons, you have people crossing the street to get to the temple, or to the fields to do exercise. These are missionary trainees. Or you have people going to the parking lot across the street because they've just gotten back from their two-year mission. And literally their, their paid job is to train other LDS missionaries. And so what they're doing all day long is they're training LDS missionaries to talk to people like you. <laughs> and so when you're outside, they're like, they're, they're more often than not pretty sweet and they're, they're kind. And they're, the Mormons are very conflict avoidant people. They're very sensitive. They're, when, when I'm at Temple Square and we have people from Chicago or New York drop by, it's just so different. It's, it's uh, hilariously different. Uh, the, the New Yorkers are almost offended by the sort of this like overly sweet, like kind of like gentle saying it, but not saying it kind of mode. And, the, and, and in our experience, they, they just, it's just more uh, to the point and direct and, uh, Whereas in Utah, people are a lot more conflict avoidant and sensitive. But um, you know, Utahns by and large are just very kind people. And they're taught that, to a fault even, they're taught that any kind of conflict is, is not spiritual, it's not of the Holy Spirit, um, it's to be avoided. And so we in part accommodated, in part accommodated that. We were just trying to be super gentle 
about introducing topics and explaining topics. So another question or another thing I like to say is, well, would you mind if I showed you a verse from the Bible? And that was important because when I got my scriptures out, um, just to use an, a, a stretched analogy here, it's almost like you're, you're getting a gun out to them. It's like, it, to some Latter-day Saints, that's just a very intimidating or very aggressive maneuver. Um, so I'm not going to stop doing that, though. I mean, it's the scriptures, like they're, it's God's word. I, I'm not here to be your super smart philosopher guy, although I'll do a philosophy and I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll do apologetics. And that's a part of the uh, uh, communicative toolkit, communication toolkit. Um, but when I get, I want to use the scriptures, though, as the chief and primary appeal to authority. And it's the instrument, it's the, it's, it's the, when I'm painting the portrait of who Jesus is, scripture is what, it's the brushstroke I want to use. Um, and so I, I want to have them look at the book with me. So I'll, I'll ask them, hey, would you mind if I showed you a verse from the Bible about that? So I remember being in front of the MTC, sorry, I'm wondering, and asking a, a guy who was jogging by to take a, if you take a track, super kind, he was a BYU student and he took one and it was about the authority of Jesus. And I asked him, uh, uh, about the topic and what he understood about it and if, um, what he thought the biggest differences were between Mor uh, Mormonism and Christianity on this topic. And I, I just asked him, uh, have you ever heard a, a born again Christian explain what they believe about authority before? And he goes, no. And I was like, you mind if I did it for a few minutes? And he's like, sure. <laughs> and so I'm just like, all right. So you mind if I get my Bible out and show you some passages? He's like, yeah, sure. So we pull it out and and here's where, for me, evangelism became about having threads. You have a topic, and you have five or six verses, maybe, um, at your disposal to talk about, about this. So but the, that became one of my favorite topics is the authority of Jesus, because in Mormon culture, authority is like the top topic. It's like, it's like the most important thing for them. By what authority are you doing these things? In some sense, for them, that's even more important than the nature of God. Um, are you baptizing by proper priesthood authority? Are you doing missionary work by proper priesthood authority? That is just so important to them. So what I would do is I would ask them about Jesus. And I'd say, well, in the four gospels, uh, how do you remember Jesus typically exercising his authority? And um, I'll have to give you just cliff notes right now, but I really fell in love with Matthew chapter eight and Matthew chapter nine, where Jesus having come down from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, they say of him, uh, he doesn't speak like the scribes, he speaks as one having authority. And immediately he starts doing these amazing miracles that don't require a kind of priestly, ritualistic uh, process. He just, you know, he tells a storm to be quiet and it's quiet. He tells a, a bunch of demons to go away and they go away. Um, he tells a man lowered through the roof, your sons, your, your sins are forgiven. And the riffraff in the back says, uh, excuse me, only God has the authority to do that. And uh, Jesus is like, you want to see a cool trick? <laughs> Jesus says, uh, what's harder to do, you know, to tell a man your sins are forgiven or, to, you know, to tell a, a lame man to get up and walk. Get up and walk. And, 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 and the guy, you know, his legs, which are paralyzed, obey Jesus's words and he gets up and walks. Or you have the centurion who sends for Jesus and says, my servant is sick to the point of death, uh, please help. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him. And, and, and the centurion says, I'm not good enough to have you step inside my front door. I'm a man of authority. And I know how authority works. I can just tell my subordinates to do something and they do it. Jesus, if you just say the word, that'll be enough. And so my, what I fell in love doing was as walking through a series of Jesus stories to paint a picture. And what I would do with Matthew 8 and Matthew 9 uh, is show how Jesus was able to heal and forgive sins and to stop storms, um, other places to give people a new name or to send people out. And he didn't need to touch them. He didn't need to do any sort of ritualistic. It, when he did touch, it was kind of counterintuitive. He'd touch a, 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 a leprous man a priest isn't supposed to touch. And Jesus stayed clean and the other man was clean. But the big idea here is that in Mormonism, uh, you need to use priestly 
authority, priestly ritual. Um, Jesus, um, uh, well, this is really interesting. At the end of sharing stories from Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9, what I'd love to do is ask Latter-day Saints, how do you remember Jesus commissioning his apostles to go preach and teach and do missionary work, to baptize also? How, how in your memory, in your view, how did Jesus authorize his disciples to go preach, teach, and baptize? And I would just stop and listen. And, and typically the answer I get was, well, he would lay his hands on them. That was really important for them because that's how priesthood authority functions. That's how it's exercised. And so what I'd say, well, let's just look at that together. And so we'd open up the last chapter, the last uh, paragraph of Matthew 28 called the Great Commission, where Jesus just says, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, baptize make disciples of all nations, I'm sorry, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So go make disciples, baptize them. He says, I'll be with you till the end of the age. Uh, Jesus, all he had to do was say the word. So um, that kind of gives you a little bit of a taste of what I would do on the street is I would ask them where they're from, if they've had any interactions with born again Christians on their mission or in their upbringing, if they've ever had any faith conversations I try to get them to put topics on the table for us to work with, and I would ask them what they thought the biggest differences were, and if they'd if they'd ever heard a born again Christian explain what we believe about that topic and explain why we believe what we believe about that topic. And I'm a, I'm an aggressive conversationalist. Uh, I have to work really hard at listening and stopping, and shutting up. And so it was also also a matter of learning to stop and listen and to help. My conversation partner feel like they're not being bulldozed. So asking open-ended questions and helping them to participate a lot. Um, it would be frustrating. So if you got a, a buddy with you who's listen, you're tag teaming, it's really, really tempting to just jump in when the other, like, like uh, I might have a friend with me and he sees me talking to someone and he feels an awkward silence. And so he jumps in and he tries to like fill in the awkward space and I'd have to explain later, hey, you know, we're just kind of slowly and gently going down a path. And he might, my conversation partner might say five different awful things like, like, I can't believe he just said that. And, and what you have to have the discipline to do as an evangelist, as a patient Christian is to just decide, I think we're just going to talk about one of those things. And I'm, I'm just, I'm going to let those other four things slide for now so that we can gently chase out the one topic and focus on it and give him some uh, room, some, uh, there's a pace and a, and, a, and a cadence, and there's a tone, and there's a kind of softness where um, if you slow down, I'm not really good at this in debates, by the way, <laughs> uh, but on the street, it's like, if you slow down, uh, it just helps people feel like they can have a longer conversation with you, like they're not like, like they don't have to run away. So you can slow down, be okay with silence and help draw out, you know, what do you think about that? Um, and I think it's awkward. Would you mind if I explain that to you? So let me stop right there and see if there's any, if Aaron, if you think this is an appropriate time just to have a, a short break, so to speak, and maybe a little bit of Q and A. Is yeah, that yeah. Uh, prudent? Yeah, anybody, yeah, you know, any questions? I mean, any, about anything he's just, Aaron just talked about, or, um, you know, about getting conversations started about other, um, I think, yeah, any, any questions now, uh, please, you know, this is a great time to just to throw them out there. I have do? one. <clears throat> no, me first. <laughs> um, what would you do? What would you do um, other than hand out tracks? Uh, you, you said, like, if you're out in front of Temple Square, because um, I found it really hard at BYU to be like, to stop somebody because everybody's going to class and stuff. And I'm just like, so it was, it was, it was hard to do that. So what do you, cause, cause when you're holding tracks, it's easy to just hold them and be like, I'm going to hand you something, you know, um, mm -hmm. what else? So to be honest, uh, I feel naked without something in my hand that really helped on the, on the sidewalk. If I'm going door to door, uh, it might be a little different. I'll, I'll say something like, 
Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm with, uh, you know, Leslie and John here, and we'd love, we're, we're born again Christians. Um, and we're just really interested in having some faith conversations with, with Latter-day Saints in the area or whoever else would talk with us. Um, I, I don't know if you're busy right now, but would you be willing to uh, discuss uh, something like that? And I, even then I'd probably hand something out. When I'm on, um, I don't go to BYU's campus very often unless I'm like meeting somebody typically. In the past, I've, I've talked with people there, but um, in the, in the, cafeteria uh, at Cougar Eat, they call it. Sometimes I would meet with people that were, that we had existing appointments. And uh, I know of Christians that just, you know, tour the campus and, but I, you know, I'm, I'm such an, uh, an active evangelist in Utah when I'm there that um, uh, they get to know my face and my name and, uh, you know, security gets to know who you are. And so I, I have to, Y'all are at an advantage that I don't have anymore. I, I have to really hang out on public domain sidewalks and um, go where people are just, just street traffic. So, I mean, so, I, but to, to, for the spirit of the question though, um, um, so this is just me. I'm a little odd in this respect. If there's people waiting across the street, if there's like enough people, if there's only like one or two, then it's too aggressive, so don't do it. But if there's like five or six or 10 or 15 people waiting across the street, or it's a friendship group, um, all that, yeah, it's fun. But if it's a, it's like a dozen people, I love to just be tour guide, you know, like Temple Square, for example, be like, hey, my name's Aaron. I'm a born again Christian. I know a lot of y'all are here to do such and such. Um, I, I, we're here to, I have a really quick message for you. And I would just preach. I would just give them a 30 second, 45 second spiel and then say, hey, if you'd like to talk, I'm, I'm happy to talk. And, and people are kind of like, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> and it's just, it, it's so strange that, you know, sometimes you'll get like one person in the crowd who just either comes back or he sticks around to talk. And that creates conversations. Um, in, uh, in other contexts, there'd be like a friendship group. And that's a little easier because if I'm approaching, you know, a young person, you know, it's 7.30 at night, you know, it's just, it, it's safer when you've got groups of people. It's just the dynamic works better. But if there's like a friendship group, I just try to be friendly and say, hey, where are you guys from? And, you know, it could be a, a group of teens or young adults. And, and uh, I don't know, I hope that helps a little bit. I'm sorry, it probably doesn't. So sorry for the delay there. Um, I really like the idea of actually opening up the Bible with them uh, since it is the truth and it's gonna pierce their heart and like convict them. But do you ever, do they ever push back since they think it's translated incorrectly to begin with? Um, yes, sometimes, but um, I have found that if, I, I have found that more often than not, you'll get somewhere, um, let me think, let me think about answering. Uh, it's by default, they really, the question really is, well, what does the text say? And what do you think it means? And are you familiar with the letter? Um, that's, that's kind of like, that's the path we typically would go down. There's, there's a, in, in Mormonism, there's kind of a backup plan, right? So they, they teach that scripture is essentially corrupt. I'm, I'm putting it more forcefully than we, they, they have very sweet rhetoric for it or some sly rhetoric for it. But essentially they think that the scriptures have been pretty significantly corrupted. So much so that we need a restoration. So much so that we need extra sets of scripture. So much so we need modern day prophets and apostles to fill in the gaps and to the Joseph Smith translation and so forth. So when there's something we share that they don't like, um, Often, 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 it's uh, it's kind of a plausible, plausibility, plausible deniability defense mechanism for them to say, you know, the Bible's been through a lot of translations, which they mean transmissions. It's been through a lot of uh, priestly corruption. We don't really know what the original said anymore. Um, and so uh, that's not the norm. That's not the typical answer I get. That we typically get to talk about the content of what, what it says. But when they do object to the reliability of the text, again, it's just a really good teaching moment because most Latter-day Saints we speak to have never, ever, ever considered or learned about what we call textual criticism. 
I'm going to assume y'all have been introduced to that, but it's this, this fancy idea that we can look at all the manuscripts. And so here's the challenge. I'll just, I'll summarize it right now, how I would summarize it on the street. And your challenge is to not only understand it, but have a really kind way of explaining it to like a 17 year old. Cause this, you really need to explain it in a non nerdy way, but I'll, I'll say things like it, you know, it's like, um, we have the trunk of a, of a tree and you've got the branches that go out and then you've got the twigs and leaves. And um, what happened in the first century is that Paul, he would write a letter and he knew that letter was just a private letter. He knew it would be distributed. In fact, he, he sent out multiple copies. You know, when, he, when he sent out Ephesians, uh, it was intentionally a circular letter. He went out to all the house churches around Turkey, basically. And so um, when he would send that letter out, it would, it would shoot out in different directions. And eventually it would shoot out to different geographic directions. And so we would have different copies of the same letter. And what we can do today is we can look at the very oldest copies that we have and trace, just like a, a genealogy tree, we can trace the manuscript families. And then if we see there's a little bit of a word changed over here, we can compare all the other manuscripts. And what uh, historians are able to do is reconstruct. We're able to reconstruct what the originals say. And uh, if, if you wanted uh, to be sure as a student of the Bible, that with a verse that has a severe uh, textual manuscript issue, you, you basically just go to Barnes and Noble, get yourself a modern English, you know, some sort of modern English uh, Bible translation and just look at the footnotes. Because if there's a textual issue, they usually just tell you the footnotes. So it's not a big deal. You can go home and you can read the Gospel of John and uh, have the default assurance that what you're reading is trustworthy. Uh, we have uh, the text today that they had back then. So I, I try to give them a, a short lesson in textual criticism and invite them to read the New Testament in modern English. That's helpful, thank you. If y'all want, I can, I can move on. Um, uh, one of the issues that I chased out over the years is what I think is the biggest difference, the starkest difference between Mormonism and biblical Christianity. I personally can't think of a bigger difference than this one. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story about how I arrived at this. Um, there's something in, in Mormonism called the Lorenzo Snow Couplet. I don't think that Christians that come to Utah who are gonna do evangelism necessarily have to become uber experts in the intricacies of Mormon heresy, <laughs> but it's super helpful to do some legwork and, you know, some preparatory work, some ground, you know, legwork like y'all are doing with the, with the scrapbook book. Um, it's super helpful for Christians to maybe read the gospel principles, which is one of the manuals they use. Uh, so yeah, the, the manuals you're using are great, but if you had to just tuck away a few things that were for memory, that are Mormon, one of them would be the Lorenzo Snow Couplet. And it goes like this, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be, some say become. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. And it's a couplet that speaks to um, the parallel between our present and God's past. As man is, God once was. And as God is, so our potential, uh, as God is, man may be, man may become. So what God is now, man may become. So, so paralleling our present with God's past and our future with God's present. So uh, I, I'll ask Mormons, have you ever heard of the Lorenzo Snow Couplet? And they might not know it by that name, it goes something like this, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. Okay. What do you think that means? Um, how do you understand that? 
And what I, what I personally do is I supplement that with a, a line from Joseph Smith's most famous sermon. It's called the King Follett Discourse. It's kind of a strange name. There's literally a dude named King Follett. I think he died falling down a well. And there was a funeral sermon that doubled as a general conference address. Uh, and in the sermon, Joseph Smith says, quote, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see, he goes on to say, God was once a man as we are now. We have got to learn how to be gods, the same as all the gods have done before us. So I remember talking about uh, this as a core difference and, and you know, this is where Mormonism's dark side really comes out. I like to say, you don't, you shouldn't demonize the Mormon people and you shouldn't romanticize them. Uh, they have their own religion, uh, but in the end, they have the same rotten forefather that we do, Adam. So it's just a variation on Adam's sin. It's not, uh, yeah, so, uh, but this is where Mormons, Mormonism's dark side really comes out. And it's, it's when I'm, talking about God's nature and his eternality and his holiness and how unique he is from us, um, not only are they rejecting the creator-creature distinction and uh, you know, the eternal differences between God and man, um, not only that, but they're being, and this is, I try to be careful the way I say this, but there's a legacy in Mormonism of learning, even on their mission, not to be super clear about this. And one of the uh, really interesting observations I, I picked up was that when we would talk to teenagers, so some of the evangelistic contexts we were in were like, we were on a public domain street that was closed off with just hordes of people and there's some big event and we're there and there's all these teenagers roaming around. So we have a lot of Christian teenagers that are doing evangelism with us. And so we're talking to, to like, you know, 16 year old Mormons. And we would ask them about Mormon doctrine and they would either know about it and they would just be super upfront about it. And, uh, and it was super refreshing. They would just be super clear and overt and honest about it because they hadn't really learned the ropes yet. They hadn't been on a mission where they've learned to really suffer often the rhetoric and be somewhat deceptive even about it or kind of careful about leaking out sort of the most shocking parts of Mormon theology. Or, or as youngins, they had not yet been exposed clearly to the quote unquote deepest parts of Mormonism. Uh, where was it going with that? Um, anyway, circling back, um, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, it's real simple. I'm a sinner. If man, as man is, God once was, and I'm a sin, man is a sinner, then was God a sinner? And I, I started asking Mormons on the street this, and they were like, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe, probably. Yeah, no big deal. He was probably forgiven on the, on account of the blood of another savior that, you know, is functioning as a savior for a different generation of the gods. I, I'm putting that more overtly than they did. It was, I had to kind of draw it out conceptually. And I, I was like, oh my goodness. I, I don't think Christians in America know that Mormons lean this. I, I don't want to say believe this, because you'll see the nuance here in a second, but they, they have space for it. They lean in this direction by and large. And so I started asking Mormon apologists who are not sweet. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a different breed. Uh, I, I really enjoy the Mormon people, my Mormon coworkers, Mormon neighbors, but the nastiest of the apologists, uh, that is just a different subset. Uh, what, what they're willing to do is a different category. Um, so I would ask the Mormon apologists, like, doesn't this suggest that Heavenly Father could have been a sinner prior to him, his exaltation, prior to him becoming a god? And the Mormon apologists who are just, they're just ready to, you know, smooth this over. They're like, no, we don't believe that. That's not official doctrine. Um, we believe God's always been God. 
Um, the, the, the Lorenzo Snow couplet's not in the canon. It's not standard works. You're making stuff up. You're making us look bad. You're just making stuff up. So I was like hearing one thing on the street and one thing online from the apologist. And so what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to take a video camera downtown and I'm just going to start videotaping my conversations with Mormons about this. And so this is where godneversend.com, I'll type it in there, um, came to fruition. I, was, I would just ask Mormons about whether, and I, there was some nuance to this, was Heavenly Father once perhaps a sinful mortal before he became a god? Was Heavenly Father once perhaps a sinful mortal before he became a god? And I learned to nuance this very carefully because if I asked, was God a sinner? They'd just say, no, no, no. And then if I dug and dug and dug and dug, it would be like, oh, well, God was never a sinner. But before God was God, he was not God. And he was a man. And then he was a sinner. That's what some would say. Or, or I, I'd say, was, was God ever a sinner? This is before I learned to nuance it. They'd say, well, in this eternity, he was never a sinner. But in, in a prior eternity, he perhaps was a sinner. Or they would say, um, and this this part like blows my head up. Like I, I don't I don't I don't have a category for how a human being could get this far in their idolatry. I would ask of this question: Was God once a sinner? And they would say, Well, well, but up front they would say no, and then I would dig, dig, and dig, and dig, and they'd say, Well, if Heavenly Father, prior to who his exaltation was a sinful mortal, he would have been forgiven having been atoned for by the blood of, the sa of a Savior. And when we are forgiven for sins, our sins are cast away as far as the east is from the west, and the Lord no, no longer remembers our sins. So if Heavenly Father was once a sinner, um, his sins are no longer remembered. So we should treat him as though he never was a sinner. So their initial answer to the question, was God ever a sinner? No. It had layers of like, well, in this eternity, he never was a sinner. Or before he was, a, as God, he never was a sinner. Or even if he was a sinner, we should treat him like he was a never a sinner because of what they would call the power of the atonement. And when they would use that term, power of the atonement, I'd be like, power of Whose atonement? And if you dug and dug and dug and dug, you not do not ever be content with the superficial language given to you. You have to dig deep for the, the meaning of it. And you start to realize, oh my goodness, we have the same dictionary, well, with the same list of terms, but the different definitions. And so I, I started realizing, oh my goodness, these people... So in, in my research, and I'm not, I'm not a professional statistician or researcher, but in my experience, about two-thirds of the Mormons I spoke to um, either believed God was once a sinner or that they believed Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinner. And it was just in the realm of it being okay, it being probable or possible, or who cares? Like, it doesn't really matter. And one-third of them would say, well... This just gets. This is where Mormonism gets really loopy and starts the the deep the spaghetti of the deep you know, it's rats rats nest of details. But um, they'd say, well, Jesus was able to become exalted as a god, and he never sinned. So maybe, and this is me kind of making it more clear than they would overtly put forth. Maybe Heavenly Father. Maybe we're lucky. <laughs> it's kind of like um, some people on Earth are born to a dad who, I don't know, I, so, some of y'all have rich parents, you know, um, in worldly terms, some of y'all come from high stock, right? You, you know, you've got good, good blood, good heritage and good, you know, just I don't, that, whatever that is, that very worldly thinking where people think, you know, this group is better than over here. Um, sorry, that came out wrong, but it's like, it's an analogy of like, in the generations of the gods, uh, in the, the family tree of spirit beings who have gods above them, some of us get lucky. And the god that we have, who was once a man who became a god, never sinned. 
So when Jesus becomes a heavenly father for a future generation of planets and people, they get the privilege of saying that their heavenly father never was a sinner. But all these other sinners that become gods, they become gods over planets with people who can't truly say our God never was a sinner in the fullest and most absolute sense of it. So some Mormons would say that there's like a, like a uh, royal line of sinless saviors. I heard that once. It's like a premium subset of the genealogy of the generations of the gods. Most of them have been sinners atoned for by the blood of another savior, say our spirit uncle or spirit great uncle, whatever. And they receive the power of the atonement. They were, they were forgiven and they become gods. But the others who became gods were able to do so without ever having sinned. I'm sorry that gets into the weeds. It's kind of like, whoa, 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 what? Anyway, um, the big idea here is, uh, the big idea is that I just can't think of a bigger difference. And this stuff is gross to me. It's awful because I have a God who is holy, holy, holy. So there's this beautiful verse in Revelation 4 where people are around the throne. In fact, there's creatures, strange creatures in Revelation 4 verse 8 who look like they're created to do something 24-7. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So when the angels worship God and when Christians worship God, we're not merely impressed with who he is today. Um, it, it's not merely that we're happy that he has attained a status. Uh, we worship a God who is something by nature, not by obtainment. He did not inherit his godhood. He always had it in himself. Uh, there's nothing about our God's past that is embarrassing. We don't say, ooh, yeah, I try not to think about like, <laughs> like it's not like a marriage where you, where you cancel out each other's transgressions and you're like, you know, keep a short list of each other's crimes against each other. And you're like, I just love you. I forgive you. We're okay. I'm not holding anything. I, I'm not going to remember anything I've ever, you know, any, your past doesn't matter to me. I love you. You love me. That's not how we treat God. We don't say, God, I love you. It's okay. I'm not going to think about your sinful past. We say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Or David in Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Uh, on this note, um, I want to talk about uh, what I call the logic of Isaiah. And it's because... Um, Rightly so, Christians use uh, a set of verses from Isaiah to outline the difference between our God and the God of Mormonism. And one of the key verses that I fell in love with, it's, if, if I ever get a tattoo, I'd be tempted to put this one on. It's Isaiah 43.10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. Before me, before me, no God was formed neither shall there be any after me. And it's a straight contrast with as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. What does God say in Isaiah? Before me, no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. So that's a good, that's a good one-liner. It's enough. You know, I, I don't need scripture to make a huge case. It just, if God says it, that's sufficient. That's a great way to put it. There's never been another God greater than or subsequent to our God. And some Mormons will say, well, what about other beings in the Old Testament that are called gods? They look like, you know, heavenly beings or angels or demons or the sons of gods. Well, that's just kind of irrelevant because the kind of God I'm talking about is the most high. He's exalted far above all gods. He's not created. He's the creator. And so what I, what really helped me, um, understand how different the God of Mormonism, the God of Christianity is, and what helped me 
uh, paint a picture of this and help explain it to Mormons is um, a string of passages. I, I, I don't have it handy right now. Um, but if you start with Isaiah 40 and just work yourself all the way up to 48, chapter, chapters 40 to 48, you can make a, just a devotion out of this. I mean, forget Mormonism for a second. And just in, like you're, you're a man or a woman on the island and you're just enjoying the glory of God. The context is that God is having a throwdown with all the other uh, witnesses of all the other nations. And it's like, come at me, bro. That's like, you know, tell me who you got. Tell me, tell me about your God. Tell me, uh, show me your deity resume, right? Show, show me what you got. And what God is doing is he's saying, there's nothing you can tell me about your gods that impresses me. And God's like, he says things like, I am the Lord, I'm Yahweh, that's my name. There is no other. <laughs> to whom will you compare me? And it, so it's not just like these factual statements about God, that's there, but it's the attitude. God is like, I'm God. You can't, you can't compare me to anybody, anybody else. Anyway, in this string of these, these chapters, there's this, uh, so one of the things I like to do in evangelism, again, making it very simple, it, I call it definition evangelism, definitional evangelism. And it's super simple. It's you pick a topic, you pick a term, and you ask them to define it. And you just, that's it. You just work with that. And so here's what I do. I'd say, well, what would you say is the definition of idolatry? What would you say is the definition of idolatry? And what you'll find is that even for just Americans, a lot of these problems with Mormonism really aren't unique to Mormonism. They're, they're very broad American problems. The typical answer I'd get is that, well, idolatry is when you say you reverence like a, like a wooden statue or like a copper statue in your restaurant or your your shrine or your the corner of your house it's when you have an idol it's like a like or mormons will say you know those passages in isaiah they're really about idols and, and you might say well yeah of course but what they're really saying is it's this is really about this is calling attention to the the inappropriateness like god commands us not to bow down before physical idols and there's something really tricky there you have to stop and think about that's not the substance of idolatry, that's the, that's the expression of idolatry. And, and so one, one way you can draw this out is to ask, and it, it's kind of funny, people like will look at you funny, but why is that wrong? Why would you say it's wrong to bow down to a Buddha statue or some figurine and bow down and worship it? Like, what's it appropriate? Like, why, what's the big deal about that? Why is idolatry so bad? Who cares? And, and just draw that out. Like, I agree that it's bad, but why would you say it's bad? Like, this is a little bit like talking with atheists. Like, I agree murder is bad, but why is it bad? Like, what's, what's the big deal? Like, what's the, what's the reason underneath? And for Christians, this really comes out in Romans 1, to jump ahead real quickly, where it says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. That's the substance of it. So going back to Isaiah, Isaiah says he's, uh, I'm sorry, God in Isaiah says he's incomparable. But you can take an idol and you can, you can it, it likens a God to something. So it doesn't make sense to use an idol. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down this list really quickly here. God has no origin, but idols have birthdays. I, idols, there's a, there's a start date for when an idol became an idol. So you can't use an idol to represent God. He, he doesn't have a birthday. He doesn't have an origin date. His humanity has a birthday, but his deity doesn't. God alone is God. I'm just kind of drawing this out from the Isaiah stretch here from 40 to 48. You can make a ton of idols. You can just stack them up, but there's only one God. So an idol is inappropriate to represent God. Here's a fun one. God doesn't get hungry. Um, but people who make idols, they get hungry. So it's not appropriate to make idols to represent God. God hides himself. Idols are visible, not appropriate. Um, God gives breath and life to all, but idols are empty wind, Isaiah says. Uh, God alone declares the past and the future. Idols don't know any of that. Um, 
idols uh, or God's God's understanding is unsearchable. He never. So the, here, here's where the difference between the God of Mormonism and the God of Christianity isn't just different. It's diametric. It's not, it's not that we're slightly off. It's that we're a hundred percent different in the, in the book of Isaiah. God says he never learned. No one ever taught him the path of understanding. Think about it. Everything that the God of Mormonism knows, he learned. Everything. And the God of, of the Bible, nothing he knows he learned. He's always had all that knowledge in himself. Um, you get this in the book of Job, and then this is restated in the last paragraph of Romans 11. God says he's never received a gift that he might be repaid. Everything that the God of Mormonism has, he received. Nothing that God has he received. He's always had it in and of himself. Um, so, uh, and then you get to stuff like most high. God is most high overall. Uh, the way I explained this to my son, John, when he was a young boy was, if God had an arm wrestling match with all the other gods, they would all lose and no one would have a tie. He would win all the arm wrestling matches. So God is in the business of, I call this supremacy evangelism. Um, when he leads the people of Israel, this was an evangelistic touch point here. I would ask them, um, why do you think we should worship God? Why do you think we should worship God? And typically they would give me a good half answer, something that we could on the surface agree with. They would say, well, he loves us. Yeah, like, of course, amen, right? Um, he loves us. He cares for us. Uh, he's our father. Now, that's a definition issue. But there, there's, there's a part of that that works, right? That's a good answer and in part. But the other side of the coin, the other half of the answer is that because God is worthy of worship. It's not about us. We're not the reference point. It's, it's not relative. It's, it's not in reference to us. What makes God worthy of worship or the reason why we should worship God is because of who he is. He can, he can beat up all the other gods. He's, he's in a class by himself. He's the most high. And so I would, I would try to paint this uh, as a picture from the redemption of Israel. Um, when God brings the Hebrew people out of Egypt, God says, I'm the one who gave you essentially a national constitution. I'm the one, you know, a, a, a covenant. I'm the one who gave you what you needed to subsist, your food and your drink. I'm the one who cared for you and attached you to myself. There's something very intimate and loving about that. And then he said, I blasted all the other gods. I, I, I defeated all the others. I, um, he, he put on a big display of his supremacy over all the other gods. So Christians in part, our evangelism is saying, so I'll end this segment. I know we're getting short on time, but I'll end this segment with this. I like to encourage Mormons to pray to the very first God. Isaiah 4, 44 verses 6 and 8 says, I am the first and I am the last. And besides me, there is no God. There's a, there's, a, there's a hymn or a song in the hymn book that Mormons sing called, uh, if if you could hide to Kolob, if you could hide to Kolob, sounds funny, but H I E to Kolob. Kolob is the, uh, I'm sure you guys heard about that. <laughs> it's, um, it's either a planet or a star, depending on who you talk to, near where God lives. Um, I think I got that detail wrong. Anyway, uh, the hymn says that we don't know when the gods began to be. So Mormonism teaches that we can have a relationship of prayer with a deity. I call him like the cosmic regional patriarch. He's a, he's a regional, he's over one branch of the family tree of the gods. He's a cosmic regional patriarch. Uh, so Mormon, Mormonism is excited about having a relationship with your particular cosmic regional patriarch but they they literally sing that they don't know who the first god is 
And so I love to encourage people. You, I mean, this is classic Christian evangelism. You can pray to this God that I'm speaking to. Uh, put it this way, in, in conversation with Mormons. Would you say you know who the first God there ever was? And the answer is, nobody knows that. That's a mystery. That's beyond us. It's irrelevant. That's not, that doesn't pertain to us. And I said, I know who the first God is. And he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to pray to him. He wants to, what Christianity teaches is that you can have a relationship with the first God there ever was. And he's intimate. He loves you. And he's the very first God there ever was. And he's quite proud of who he is and who his, what his name is and what his unique supremacy is. And what Christianity does is it, it celebrates this God that is the perfect marriage of all the attributes of deity in one being that are so hard for us to imagine could be you know, together. Perfect humility and supremacy. This creator God who descends to become a man. Um, uh, one of the things I would love to preach outside of Temple Square during Christmas time, especially, is that um, Mormonism teaches that man became a god, but Christianity teaches, the Bible teaches, especially at Christmas, that God became a man. I'll stop there, or else I'll sermonize and monologue for another 15. Any questions? Yeah, any questions about, about that or about anything? Yeah, I got another one. <clears throat> uh, so you said, I, I wrote down the cosmic regional patriarch. I really like that. That was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, you said, you said uh, I like how you're, you're contrasting with the God that we have. And you call him the, the first God there ever was. And I was writing that down. And I stopped at the first God and I was like, there ever was, there's no more. I don't want to say the wrong things. I don't want to like give too much to them, but I don't, you know, I, I think what, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your, your point is you're, you're showing them that we have different ideas of God and they, they're confused. They think we all had the same one. So I think that's what you're doing. But I, my, my irk is I don't want to I don't want to give them any like I worship the first ma the main one when there's other ones as well we whatever but the main one I don't know how much do you how much do you give them in their false ideology or how much do you change the wording to be there's only one God forever and I worship him you're we all do right. have some precedent in scripture for this kind of language in Psalm 97, verse 9, it says, you are, you are far exalted above all gods. Speaking of the Most High, he's far exalted above all gods. Uh, and I think there's a repeat statement to that effect in Psalm 99. I'm sorry, I forget. Um, uh, among the Elohim, there's no other, there's no Elohim like Jehovah. He's, it'll, it'll, uh, Elohim is the true Jehovah. Jehovah is the true Elohim. Um, <clears throat> the term Elohim does seem like it has semantic range in the Bible at some points to be inclusive of angelic beings. We might use the generic category of heavenly beings. So if, if for the sake of conversation, we were to use the word God, which is a reasonable, or God's, excuse me, a, a reasonable translation of Elohim. The big idea is that typically Elohim is referring to the one true God, Jehovah. There are usages in the Bible referring to false gods in plural, or perhaps a plurality of heavenly beings. You might call them the sons of God. They're created beings. They're subordinate beings. They're judged. Um, I, I'm okay just using that language to kind of help paint a picture if scripture did it, I think we can do it. Not Aaron, not to go completely off 
tangent with this, but have you read any of Michael Heiser stuff? I mean, just mentioning this, or I don't know what, do you have an opinion on like, cause he uses that language and the, you know, the Elohim and uh, I was, cause I've been interested to wonder how, if we could use that in some of our dialogue with LDS. And I don't know if you've thought about that. So I, I'm a look, I'm cautious about how much of him I appropriate, but I think he's been helpful. And I've seen teachers that I trust like John Piper, um, at least go far as to say that, so if, if you go to the Ask Pastor John podcast, he covers Psalm 82, where it looks like, I don't know if it's inheriting or deriving directly from Heiser, but it looks like Piper adopts the position that the gods in Psalm 82 are not earthly judges. They are heavenly beings and they're, they're judged to die like men. Their, their condemnation, the result of their condemnation is to die like uh, us, like, like men. So that's probably the most common verse that comes up with Mormons that have studied this issue a bit. Uh, John 10, where Jesus quotes Psalm 82. And the line of conversation, it's, for me, is typically, well, let's look at it. It's like six verses. Um, first question, are these God's role models? Do you want your kids to be like them someday? <laughs> Will you be a proud daddy if your kids grow up to be like the gods of Psalm 82? Because the gods of Psalm 82 are not the kinds of role models even for Mormonism. Uh, in fact, when John in John 10, when Jesus is addressing the crowd and he says, is it not written, ye are gods? He's not addressing a bunch of, of, uh, of uh, what do you call it when you get first in class when you graduate? It's the, like valedictorians? It's the, they're not, they're not valedictorians of spirituality. When Jesus is addressing the crowd in John 10, they're the, they're the Pharisees. He's, he's condemning them. He's mocking them. He's, he's coming down hard on them. And so when he does a throwback to Psalm 82, I think in part it's to say, um, you know, if, if they're called gods, you know, how much more appropriate is it for the son of God to be called equal with God? If he's calling the audience gods by extension it's not a compliment because the gods of psalm 82 were on a downward slope so it's not a it's not a model of exaltation it's a model of condemnation it's not about men becoming gods it's about gods being condemned to die like men which in reality i think we could say conceptually just and angels that had some sort of jurisdiction that's some sort of, of, of uh, job duty that they failed at, and they ended up being wicked judges who exploited the poor, who were oppressive, that God, that, that Jesus himself came down hard on. Yeah, especially I was, we're reading, I'm, we're in, uh, Cole and I are in this uh, Colson program, I'm reading the, uh, seek, I'm reading seek, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, it's that Nabil, Nabil, Nabil Qureshi book, and it's talking about the origins of Islam, and Muhammad was visited by two angel, two spirit beings. And it's just, you think about these similarities between, you know, so I know some people think that like Sandra, and I don't know where you, th that, that Joseph Smith made up the first, you know, encounter or whatever, but if there was the, if they were visited by these beings, it seems like maybe that could answer some of that, you know, clearly they're not, it's not, it's not Yahweh. It's these lesser Elohim that are posing yeah so again, i don't want to get derailed on that because uh, people are thinking that's that's crazy but uh yeah any other other questions or comments um any, anything that uh anything that aaron talked about tonight or just you know just questions about evangelism in um you know utah um questions for him i mean again he's probably any conversation you're going to have i'm sure he's probably had that summer conversation 10 20 times so you know he's a great person to bounce ideas off of Hey, Aaron. Um, I don't necessarily have a specific question off the top of my head, but I just wanted to say that um, I found your YouTube channel like a couple of years ago, and pretty much everything that I've learned about Mormonism has been just binge watching your uh, YouTube channel. So I'm that's, really thankful for all the material that you provide. Appreciate it. Please, God. Um, I wanted to ask if they seem interested in further conversation, like during street evangelism, do you think it's appropriate 
to share your contact information with them so you can continue those conversations or what do you yeah, think? Yeah, we would use Facebook um, more and more. So we used to do email address, um, but what I ended up doing is just say, hey, would you mind if I, um, to prevent me from dropping the ball, what I'd say is, would you mind if I sent you the link to that article like right now? Like if you give me your, your number or your Facebook name, I'll, I'll just send it to you as a message right now. You mind if I, and the epic, sure. Or if you're not comfortable with it, I'll write it down for you. If you want to text me later, if, if you're feeling up to it. So yeah, that's absolutely great habit to get into. And the, the best of evangelism encounters can result in follow-up breakfasts. And um, my wife and I have pe had people, I mean, God's been so good. We've had these epic, we've had couples come over to our house, um, you know, just, through follow-ups and uh, I remember uh, giving a track to a young lady and putting my contact information on it and I think it was like eight years later she pulled it out of a drawer and she <clears throat> she found my address and she wrote me a big long letter testifying to her belief in Joseph Smith and she could tell, you know, what our, con our conversation had stuck with her. Sorry, I'm kind of wandering off, but yeah, it's super, super helpful. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't know, do you, maybe if anybody's having any more questions, Aaron, do you have any, um, just like, I don't know, one or two of your favorite evangelism stories, either that went really well or went really bad, <laughs> that you can share with us? You know, I'm sure that some of them are a little bit, you know, everyone's a little nervous about just the opportunities to share. We'll be, at, we'll be, at, we'll be at BYU. We might actually go to uh, the Provo Temple. We're going to probably go door knocking. So, um, you know, probably a little bit of trepidation there, but yeah, do you have any one or two good you know, either a good one or a bad one. Um, really thankful for Jessica. Uh, we met her at the north, at the corner of Temple Square, where people come out of the temple. And Luke and uh, Lee spoke to her, did follow up, a lot of follow up. And she ended up joining our church and being baptized as a believer and uh, it was the real deal. And she uh, had the real fallout with family. Um, and then, you know, it's, that's pretty neat. Uh, <clears throat> I can, I can email you her baptism video story if you'd like. Um, I have um, well, those some fun memories. Talk to a lot of atheists. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I have a lot of these written and I have to go back and go through them. Just give me a second. In Utah, uh, especially Provo, um, there's not a lot of African Americans, uh, not, not a lot of black neighbors. The percentage is super low and uh, there was a guy who claimed to be a Baptist minister who became a Mormon. I think his name is Wayne Myers. And I emailed him and I said, I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to talk. And so he joined us at the North Gate of Temple Square. And I think he was kind of like getting ready for a, like a, a throwdown. We, we were just respectful to him and just let him kind of let him have his word and ask him some questions and had a good discussion with him. And I kind of forget how it progressed from there, but um, he invited me to come down on a show. I'm like, what show? And uh, it was, um, it was like, so I, I showed up to this house where they had this double garage converted into like a studio and you walk into this massive house 
and there were like um, 30 to 40 black Mormons, which in Utah is like, what are you talking about? Like that's like all of them <laughs> from all of Utah County. I'm exaggerating, but um, and so I walked in, and he basically allowed me to come up on stage, and um, I think he kind of wanted to have a spirited back and forth, but I basically just got to share the gospel. He basically handed me a, a microphone, and I got to share the gospel with like the whole community of black Mormons that were tuning in and it wasn't any spectacular show. It was just, you know, talking about grace and how God saved me when I was in high school, and shared Romans four and God justifies the ungodly. And then people just started asking me, I mean, it's very not Utah ish because Utahans are just very conflict avoidant. So we had a Q and a and people were just asking like spirited questions from the, from the audience. And this old black lady gets up talks, talking about stuff. And I was like, well, Colossians 1 says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. So he created every, I think it was just, that's it, on the YouTube channel. You could find it. Um, but it was just kind of like, what is God doing? This is like, what? Like, <laughs> um, uh, after the uh, Kwaku debate, I got a bunch of emails um, and then messages. I shared some of them with you. Um, people who were just, you know, listeners and, um, some people who were kind of transitioning out, um, some Mormons who wanted to talk. And I got one message from a Mormon missionary down in Provo. He was like, yeah, I saw your debate. Um, basically, they were under COVID restrictions, so they were bored. <laughs> and so they were like, could you just come down and, and do a dialogue with us on video? And we just wanted to have like an interfaith dialogue. So, you know, I'm a little cautious about that because interfaith dialogue can take the spirit of like pluralism where you're just kind of perspectival and you stop being an ambassador for Christ. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm pretty wary of that. But I, I was able to come down and I, was, I went, walked into the LDS chapel and sat down on a chair and had an audience of like six LDS missionaries. And we just sat, this missionary and I, set on chairs and basically I had another microphone and he was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but more or less, it was basically like, so tell us what you believe. And I just got to share the gospel with a bunch of Mormon missionaries. And it, it was just like, God was like encouraging me. So that's, that's kind of microphone stuff. But um, I tell you like, uh, some of the sweet, so this, 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 this is just off camera stuff. The, 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 the sweetest friendships that I've ever cultivated were cultivated working with other believers, sharing the gospel together. And I, I just have a lot of memories at Temple Square where I've worked all day. I'm tired. I barely get my, my dinner in, kiss my wife get in the car. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this today, <laughs> but we're scheduled to. <laughs> so we show up at 6.30, 7 o'clock, and we don't leave till like 1.30 in the morning. We pray, Lord, give us one good conversation. And then um, it's happened multiple times where people will walk through the south of the North Gate and they'll say, you know, I just came to Temple Square today because I felt like I, got, I wanted God to speak to me. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And then we ended up just sharing the gospel with them and we'd sit down on the grass and we would just have a gentle conversation with them and we would plead with them and share with them till wee hours of the morning. And, and uh, that, that is really sweet uh, people, with people from other churches and uh, from different kinds of churches. So we would have believers from like five or six different churches we had Anthony, who was like super charismatic, who when he'd pray with us, he would shout and he would declare victory over the demons, you know, in his prayers. And we'd be like, oh, <laughs> he's like super, super enthusiastic, charismatic. And we've got some stodgy, you know, like pretty low key Presbyterian Calvinistic nerds with us. And then we've got some brothers from like an attractional church, you know, 
more seeker sensitive. And there's a few in the church there that I have a bug for evangelism. And we would all get together at like 6.30 or 7. And we would greet each other and we'd pray together. And we'd encourage each other. And to be honest, you know, we would correct each other at times like, brother, that's too aggressive. Or, um, and they would just, we would just watch each other. And there's something about normalizing evangelism in real time where you see a few other brothers do it and you're like, oh, I can, okay, I can do that. That's repeatable. Um, or you see people do a conflict, like a drug addict or the rare super aggressive atheist or Mormon who's just can't control their emotions. And you get the best of brothers that shines out where they're de-escalating and they're peacemakers. I mean, that is just a beautiful thing. And so what we would do at the very end of the night, typically about 10, 10, 30, maybe 9, 30, is we'd gather around and we would sing. And we are just, say, five to 10 believers. And we're a little ragtag bunch with our evangelism fanny packs or backpacks, um, you know, happy that we got to have one or two good conversations and get out tracks. And we'd sit in a circle or stand in a circle and we would say, how'd your night go? And we'd, you know, I got to talk to so-and-so. It was a great conversation. I had a terrible conversation. And we would, we would just pray for the people we spoke to and we would sing and we would pray. And you know, you've got this massive pagan temple that's looking over you with these just beautiful million dollar light systems and you know superstructures everywhere and we're just on the public domain sidewalk and we're praying to the god of the universe and we're expecting him someday to come back and win the battle for us and draw people to himself and declare victory and make his name great and love and lovingly draw people to himself in utah and then um, over, over the years, the security guards there, at first the LDS temple security guards, they're like CIA wannabe rent-a-cops with like super like, like um, secret service looking earpieces and they're big ex-military cops and whatever. And they, they, they'll, they, at first we had kind of had a, a hostile relationship and they would come, like in the earliest years, they would actually come out into the sidewalk and they would aggressively kind of join the conversations, kind of brood over them and intimidate people from talking to us. And then then they just kind of got used to us coming. We just kept coming back every Thursday night. And then we started striking up friendly conversations. And then it's like, hey Aaron, <laughs> hey Will. <laughs> and then and then we would pray for them. And then um my wife and I would be at Chick-fil-A with their kids and Lo and behold, this LDS security guard comes into Chick-fil-A with his wife and we sit and I get to share the gospel with him. And I mean, it's really hard not to fall in love with evangelism. when You're doing it with brothers you love, and you're sharing a gospel you love. And it really helps you make, it helps you fall in love with the people because it's not just online battles with the worst of argumentative Mormons. It's not just the worst characters of Mormon apologetics. <laughs> um, it's uh, the real people who are coming down, you know, for dates with their wife, or there's teenagers out there, youth groups, um, and like that, like you know, we have a beautiful gospel of of uh, there's a pleasure and a joy in sharing the the gospel of who God is and what grace He offers, even if people are super hostile and rejecting and they're, they're stiff stiff necked about it. There's a pleasure in sharing the gospel of grace and the supremacy of God. And we're, um, it helps, I'm sorry to, uh, I'll end on this. Um, Ephesians talks about how God has gifted the church. He's, he's given the church apostles, um, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Did we get that right? Five old list. Um, so he gave the church evangelists for the building up of the body of Christ. And it, by my experience anyway, it, it, you know, you could say, well, every Christian's supposed to be an evangelist. Every Christian's supposed to do evangelism. That's true to some extent, but for those of you who are bent toward evangelism, you're like, you're wired especially for evangelism. 
I think the way God has designed you to bless the local church is to galvanize, is to share stories, is to get on social media and talk about the people you were able to speak to this past week. And what it does is it had this, it has this emboldening effect on the rest of the people of your church. And it really brings to bear like the truths of the gospel. And it really encourages them with your boldness um, and with your suffering, even you know, the bad stuff that happens. And it really has a way of flavoring your church with an over uh, courage to share the gospel. And it has a downstream effect on the teenagers and they start wanting to come out. So finding some regularity to do that. So anyway, I hope that's a good sales pitch for some of y'all to move out to Utah and find yourself a fishing hole. And then a group of brothers and sisters in Christ, you can come out regularly do evangelism. Any, any last questions, comments? Uh, I just Aaron, thought of, um, or, oh no. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's my I turn. just thought of something oh. really quick. Uh, do you want to go? Joe? <laughs> I was going to ask, do you have any um, advice for talking to ex-Mormons? Um, so <clears throat> it's simple. Uh, same questions that we would ask to Mormons. So this is a, just real quickly. Um, a lot of the Mormons we speak to won't be Mormons in 10 years. A lot of them are already on their way out, if not formally, at least functionally. So one of the questions I would ask is, um, if you weren't a Mormon, what religion would you be? If you weren't a Mormon someday, hypothetically, would you still believe in Jesus? And if you weren't a Mormon, do you think there are good reasons to trust the Bible and trust that Jesus has risen from the dead that aren't dependent on Mormonism being true. So to the ex-Mormon who's already on their on their uh, who's already out, um, it's it's the simple question of has have you ever heard a Christian explanation for why we think the resurrection of Jesus is credible? Like there's a plausible case to be made for it. Might not win your heart over it, but it might help loosen the soil to help you take it seriously. Um, another one I'd so for me, this is like making a beeline to the gospel. It's not where I stop. It's where I start. It's, um, have you ever heard of a good argument? Have you, have you ever heard a good argument for the existence of God? Really simple. And um, if they say yes, I'd say, well, like, what have you heard? I'd, love, I'd be in interested to hear. Why didn't you find it compelling? And if they say no or whatever, you could say, well, would you mind if I explain one? So for me, one of the most powerful in deductive form or syllogistic form, ones that really helped me was the moral argument for God, which I'm sure Aaron Marshall's been at some point sharing, that um, if there is no God, there are no objective moral values or duties, but there are objective moral values and duties, therefore there is a God. So I would, I would go on that path and I would just use it as a stepping stone to talking about moral failure, our need for the gospel, um, so really practical. So this is apologetics, but another thing is just to ask, were you ever able to visit any Christian churches? So one of the helpful things in Utah is to just get a list of two or three churches that you think are worthy of recommendation. And then just to eagerly invite them, say, hey, even if it's just this Christmas or Easter and you're feeling like you want to be religious for a weekend, um, why don't you just come and check it, check it out and, and just it might be a culture shock, but uh, I know the pastor would love to take you out to lunch, love to take your family out to lunch or take you out for coffee um, and, and love to explain what they believe and they'd be kind to you. They'd be glad to be glad. They, they need to hear simple invitations like that. I hope that helps. And there's a book by Rob Bowman that I, I've bought multiple copies of um, where he contrasts the historical case. Rob Bowman is his name, Robert Bowman. He's an apologist, and he uh, contrasts the historical case for the first vision and its witnesses with the resurrection of Jesus with its witnesses. So the, the, the ex-Mormon mentality is that event ended up being discredited, so why should I take 
the resurrection event seriously. And so Bowman talks about how, just how different the two historical cases are. Is that book on Amazon or? It is. Okay. It's, it's called Jesus's Resurrection and Joseph's Visions. I'll type it in the uh, group chat. Cole, you had a qu one last question? Oh, no, mine wasn't a question. I was just going to say, Aaron, you sold me. I'll move to Utah. <laughs> You're there, aren't you? Yeah, but I have to go back home. But then <laughs> I'll move here. OK, sweet. I'm glad you're coming back. We'll hope to see y'all someday, some of y'all, including you, Cole and Aaron. My goal here at the seminary is to sharpen my sword, come back, serve the church. Yeah, and we'll, I mean, uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to, you'll be able to, in the future, be able to do these live with the groups that we bring out when you're back here in Utah. But uh, they're, they're going to get a chance to hear from Bill McKeever and from Rob Savolka and Brian and um, probably hopefully Rich. So they'll get a, they'll get a lot of, good uh, well, we, we got a really a lot of really good speakers that's that's really that i love that you there's just a lot of really just men and women just love jesus that, out here in utah it's just i mean it's a small community but it's just really it's a neat community and so you'll get a chance to to meet a lot of them when y'all are out here so well thank you so much aaron would you uh would you pray for the group i know that again you know they'll be out here for a week we'll be doing evangelism would you just pray for us and pray for god to to do some work for you know in the group and uh in the conversations that we have while they're out here yeah you bet <clears throat> father in heaven please bless my brothers and sisters please whet their appetite for evangelism please stir their hearts for the Mormon people uh, please use this as a launch pad for better understanding their faith and being uh, more excited to dive into your word that their own faith would be strengthened. Father, please uh, prepare their steps that you would give them the right conversations with the right people. Uh, Father, please forgive us uh, for our sins when we misbehave in evangelism or overreact or, or, or are cowardly. Uh, we, need your, uh, we need your grace applied generously as we try to represent your name. Uh, please bless... Uh, Aaron's family, Aaron Marshall's family, uh, that they would continue to be able to serve in Utah. <clears throat> please bless Cole as he moves back. And please, Lord, uh, would you please continue to send people to Utah to, uh, I want to say, infect the state, so to speak, but just to, to reach it, to, to be uh, uh, leaven, a good leaven uh, that it would spread your name, spread your love, spread uh, healthy churches, Christian infrastructure, that they would grow old in Utah to be 70, 80 years old and to disciple young men and women in local churches. <clears throat> in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, well, thank you so much, Aaron. That was great. Um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll record this. I'll, I'll, I'll get this posted on my, I'll send on my website well, we've got some stuff posted to everybody so that if you missed any of our other talk, uh, stuff we've done. And then um, remember, we'll have one last Zoom meeting uh, in two Sundays. And then, um, so what's it, three, three weeks from yesterday, y'all will be here. So we're excited to, uh, to keep praying and keep, uh, you know, keep praying that God's going to do some cool things for us during this trip. So um, all right, well, uh, I'll hang on. I'll hang out if you might need to, to chat afterwards. But uh, this is really great and appreciate you, Aaron, and hope everyone has a great Valentine's Day. All right, see y'all later. <laughs>